Sunday, Palm Sunday, marked that return. It was a day of eager anticipation for the poor of Jerusalem, who had heard of Jesus' message and were hoping for someone to lead a revolution against the Roman takeover of their holy city. Jesus returned knowing full well that there was a price on his head. He had been traveling and teaching, and the local authorities were not at all pleased with this. He returned to find eager throngs welcoming him as he rode into town on a donkey, covering the mud on the path with their cloaks and tree branches. Hosanna, they shouted. They were asking for him to save them. This week, between Palm Sunday and Easter, the week Jesus is said to spend offering his greatest gifts and blessings to all who would listen, and many who didn't want to hear. On the day before he was to be captured and put to death, he gathered his followers around him to share their Passover meal. At this time of greatest crisis, when most of us would be overcome by fear and rolled over with anxiety, Jesus engaged in a universal act of comfort, of compassion, of spiritual strengthening, he broke bread with his community. He stood in the midst of fear and he reached for hope. He taught followers to do the same. Three weeks ago, a group of 18 youth and adult chaperones from this church made a journey into the unknown, seeking new understanding and new hope. We participated in the City Reach program of the Episcopal City Mission. Learning, learning about and working with homeless men and women on the streets of Boston. You helped send us there by buying raffle tickets for the dinner for six, which turned into a dinner for eight. In the process of learning about homelessness, we had the very distinct honor of feeding people who are hungry on the streets and feeding people who are hungry right here in our own very We went to City Beach thinking we would feed others, and we did. But we also found ourselves fed and nourished and challenged in new and important ways. Last week, you heard Clara Hyde reflect on her experience. And this morning, Miranda Chinman will share a testimonial as we reflect on and prepare for communion in this community. Here are a few words we made in our family to capture some of our experience as we left City Beach. Hope. Oh. Writing my fear down. 
thrown on paper made my competitive nature come out. I now needed to overcome my fear. I was not going to let my fear get in the way of the experience. This was not as easy as just telling myself, your fear is now gone. Go on through the experience, not thinking about stereotypes. I saw how difficult this would be right off the bat when we heard of the homeless people's stories. I thought, how could I judge these people whom I do not even know? How could I put them in the category of dirty, old, lazy people when I had never even spoken a word to them before? Who gave me the right to judge them? I worked hard for the next two days trying to overcome these stereotypes. I found that once I acknowledged the fear, it was easier to correct it. Once I got to know the city beach staff and had conversations with the homeless people, the dirty, old, lazy people turned into amazing, incredible people. These people have been through so much in their lives, but none of them are bitter or resentful. They were uplifting, wonderful people, but my stereotypes kept coming back. They came back when we went to do outreach on the street, handing out sandwiches and spreading the word about the common cathedral. We would pass homeless people on the street, their homeless tour guide, Michael would come point them out and tell us if they were homeless, but too proud to show it. Some of the homeless, I would never have guessed they were homeless by looking at them, but others looked at what I thought when I heard homeless. I had to go way out of my comfort zone and walk up to the people who didn't look like what I considered to be homeless people and offer them food solely on their appearance. I had to trust my tour guide, a homeless person himself, who I had met less than 24 hours ago. I was not at all comfortable about going up to random people on the street and offering them something when they could have just been standing there. I had to trust that if someone looked like they wanted help or someone to talk to, then they would accept my food or my friendship. Throughout the experience, I caught myself a few more times going back into my stereotypes. I consistently tried to break them, but I realized it's harder to change something you already think than just magically saying, you now don't judge or think of stereotypes. I still have stereotypes, but I'm working on changing them. It is not something I can change overnight. I hate that I judge these people. I don't want, I don't know that I am slowly working towards changing them. Writing this testimony will make me think about the experience differently. I realize that I accomplished my hope by trying to overcome my fear. Thank you. 
teenagers from the suburbs that they knew the hip hop artist Jay Z. <laughs> and then they realized he hadn't said Jay Z. He was asking about Jay Z. You know, Jesus Christ. Did they know Jesus Christ? They were relieved to be able to say they did know Jesus Christ. I didn't get a chance to talk too much more about that story with Olivia and Clara, but I'm pretty sure that their casual, yeah, we know JC, wasn't the kind of knowing JC that their friend was asking about. JC was code. He was asking if they belonged to a particular club. He likely meant to ask if they knew Jesus as a personal friend, a savior, a help in times of trouble. And there are some of us in this congregation who do indeed know Jesus in that way. Many of us, though, know Jesus Christ, who is a symbol of an exclusive club of salvation, surrounded by dense church doctrine that leaves us out for reasons of who we are and what we believe. This morning, as we prepare to share in a ritual of communion, I invite us to take a new look at that ritual done in J.C.'s name and memory. For me, it was redefined permanently on my first visit to Common Cathedral, a weekly worship service on Boston Common, right next to Park Street Station, led by the same folks who lead the City Reach trips our teams went on. I was studying for ministry at the time, and a Unitarian Universalist friend of mine was doing his field education placement with Episcopal City Mission. He invited me along. He said it was unlike any church he had ever been to, an experience I wouldn't want to miss. Let me just say right now that I am not someone who stops to listen to street preachers, no matter who they are. Martin Luther King Jr. himself could be standing on a street corner preaching, and I would walk right by, irritated that someone was taking up space that way. So I do not like it. For me to show up at a worship service held outdoors and stand there as a participant was, to say the least, uncomfortable. But I was determined to have this new experience. So there I was, leaning against a tree, <coughs> trying to look like a disinterested onlooker who just somehow happened to pass by. I didn't want to be mistaken by all the other people passing by as someone who cared. A little before one o'clock, the designated time for the service to begin, a group of people, my friend included, wheeled a huge wooden box across the street from the back of the Episcopal Cathedral, dodging the light traffic of Sunday afternoon on Tremont Street and pushing it right up in front of Park Street Fountain. After a few minutes of setting up and unlocking different doors, there was an altar, complete with a large cross and the elements for communion. The Reverend Debbie Little, who was indeed a petite woman in her early 40s, spoke the words of invocation from the Episcopal liturgy. It would be more accurate to say that she shouted them, having to make herself heard over the din of traffic and pigeons and chatting passersby. As she spoke, simple song sheets were handed out, and everyone joined in what seemed to be familiar Christian hymns, all new to my ears. The service went on like that, with the Reverend Little shouting pieces of liturgy, then leading the group in song, speaking prayers, and having everyone join in the prayers they wanted to offer. People stood at all distances, and the congregation seemed to shift in and out during the 30-minute service. People would wheel up a shopping cart and listen for a while, maybe sing a favorite song, and then move on. Others had been gathered for an hour before the service began, eagerly waiting to stay and certain to stay the whole time. A lot of people arrived just at the end of the service, as communion was about to be offered, and even more people arrived to line up after the service was over for the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that were handed out by the dozens, along with whatever clothing items had been collected during the week. I stood there as the service progressed, trying to figure out if I was going to be a student of religion or a participant in it, as I casually hugged the tree that afternoon. There was a clear and palpable community that had gathered. People greeted each other as they arrived. They even greeted me. Someone asked if 
I had been to the service before, and we struck up a conversation. He launched into a whole long story about how religion was a bunch of hooey, and kept telling it to me in whispers, all of his experiences of religion being worthless as the service was going on. I was listening to him with one ear and trying to listen to the service with the other, but the main thing on my mind, the thing that was causing me the most anxiety, was the knowledge that communion would come at the end. While seminary had invoked in me a new appreciation of the stories of Jesus, I couldn't call myself a Christian in the same way that folks who were Episcopal did, certainly not the way Catholics did, or any other mainline Protestant church I had heard of. I didn't think that the bread and wine were really the body and blood of Christ, no matter how much I read about the theory behind that transfiguration. And I had not taken up the call to follow Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Did I have any right to take communion? As I was intellectually weighing the pros and cons of taking communion, was it a bunch of baloney or a powerful ritual that mattered? Was I a fraud if I took part in something I wasn't sure I believed in? What would other people think of me if I did it? What would they think of me if I didn't? The service went on, and before I knew it, the Reverend Little was saying the words of Jesus over the bread and wine, and people started talking among the crowd, started walking among the crowd, offering it to anyone who wanted it. The man next to me, the hater of religion, started to move forward. He tapped my arm to get me to go toward the folks offering communion, too. I hesitated, really puzzled that he was the one pulling me forward. He looked at me a little exasperated. Now is not the time to say you're not one of us, he said. This is the part where we say we need each other. This is the only part of religion that is not bunk. You wouldn't be here if you didn't need us. This is the part where we say we need each other. I've never looked at communion the same way since. Communion, in the simplest terms, is a shared meal. It's in fact the simplest of meals. Bread and wine, bread and water, any kind of bread you have on hand, any kind of liquid that is available. It's so simple that anyone can do it. It's so profound that everyone does do it the world over. Sharing meals is a human phenomenon that's important both physically and spiritually in every culture. We are all vulnerable to hunger. We are all fed by companionship. Sharing food, we offer up that vulnerability to each other. Buddhists would say this is where we feel our connection and our suffering. Coming together in that hunger, we acknowledge all of our human desires that render us weak, our thirst for love, our quest for belonging, our yearning for success, our desire to be free. The fear we bring to a common table is the fear of not realizing any of those things we yearn for. It's the anxiety we bring to a dinner party with a group of strangers, or the first day at a new job or a new school, or on first date. Will they understand me and my sense of humor? Will they treat me kindly? Will I feel in, at home enough to show them who I really am? It's also the hope that we dare not speak. The hope of realizing our union, of finding that abiding love, of knowing ourselves in beloved community, infinitely cherished, our hearts at peace. The hope ultimately, is nirvana, a glimpse of our connection with all beings and the source of being itself. In my house growing up, when we had a loaf of bread, we called that end piece of the loaf of bread, that part that's all crust and not really too much soft stuff, <coughs> the heel of the loaf. Like the heel of your foot, it's the part that's the most crusty, tough. <laughs> No one wanted to eat the heel. But no new loaf would come out of the pantry until we finished the heel of that last loaf of bread. It was the ugliest, 
the least desirable piece of bread. We fought endlessly over who would have to take the heel for their last sandwich. In communion, we are invited to come forward with the ugliest, the least desirable parts of ourselves, the parts where the pain has solidified into constant worry, or too much bluster, or denial of our own gifts. And we're asked to see it as valuable, as a tool for connection with our neighbors who, amazingly, have the same things we do. The heel of the loaf of bread of our beings becomes the source of healing, of wholeness. We offer nourishment to one another when we offer our vulnerability openly. We take strength from knowing that we're not alone. This dance of hope and fear is one that we live all day, every day. It moves like a sine wave through our lives. We ride a crest of hope only to be dashed by a fearful anticipation of the next thing to come. Hope gets its way again only to be crushed by a disappointment. Most days there are so many of those ups and downs we can't even register them all. We ride those waves through our days, through our weeks, through our whole lives in the midst of one of the most dangerous spiritual illusions, that we are alone. Buddhists call the illusion of our separation the singlest, single greatest cause of our suffering. We feel the pain of distance from our neighbor, from the source of life, and we forget somehow that our connection is deeper and truer than we can imagine. Yearning for union with the divine is, of course, the source of spiritual inspiration of all of the Abrahamic faiths. And for all that Islam, Judaism, and Christianity have inspired in terms of factionalism and war, they share a simple message that we should not be divided by tribe and nation, that we are united as a human family. On the eve of his own persecution and death, Jesus called his community around him and said, Remember that kind of life we need one another to live. Remember the life that I have lived. Remember the lives of our ancestors. He took part with his followers in the Seder meal, part of the season of Passover, itself a remembrance of the story of the people who were freed from bondage, the story of a people who strove to live according to God's ways. The story of a people who knew constant struggle, who felt heartache and hunger in all their forms. He was reminding people that there could be sustenance in the most difficult, painful times, if only we remember to feed one another. Knowing that his presence was a thorn in the side of those who wanted to keep their wealth at the cost of others' lives, Jesus ate with the poor. Knowing there were people who would rather let people die than expose themselves to disease, he spent time with those who were sick. Knowing that no one was without value, he spent time with criminals, with prostitutes, with all those who were cast aside and could be forgotten. It was to all of us, to anyone who has felt outside or wondered how to come more fully into community, that Jesus offered a reminder of this simple and profound ritual. He wasn't inventing something new, but stressing the importance of celebrating something ancient and universal. This, my friends, this Sunday of our year is the part where we say we need each other. We say it a million ways on Sundays all through the year, but this is a very special way to engage in it today. Let's remember to offer the healing that comes of knowing the heal in ourselves, of offering it openly to each other, and finding peace and companionship. Where there is compassion and love, there we will find holiness. Let it be so for us. Let us sing the be hard to us once again.
copied and manifolded and it barely got to the opening of Tanglewood in time to be rehearsed. Sergei Kuzovsky wanted a great fanfare for the grand opening and this dream come true of his, the founding opening of the Berkshire Music Center. I couldn't write a fanfare. It was just at the time that those motorcycles were going along through Belgium and onto France. And it was the fall of France, and I felt like no fanfare. No matter how loud you sing it, no matter how fast you sing it, you cannot turn it into a joyous alleluia. There are many ways of saying alleluia, blessed be the name of the Lord. You can shout it, and you can whisper it. In the book of Job, it says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, you can say alleluia in sadness. And that is what I was doing when I wrote this piece. So please do not sing it fast and loud. It cannot be done. Handel sang hallelujah in a whole different way, in a joyful way. And we'll get to hear the Meeting House Choir sing that next Sunday. But when it says, thy will be done, blessed be the name of the Lord, a submission to God's will, then you have to say it as I tried to say it, in that hallelujah. Because a great tragedy was taking place, and it was the best I could do. No fanfare, only hallelujah. Resignation to destiny. Mm -hmm. 